Good morning, you guys. Clarissa and I are getting real up close and personal because I'm just trying to say something and she's mic'd up. <laughs> so, um, okay, just wanted to make sure some of you are just now coming in. If I can have everybody for just a step. Okay, I've had a couple of people say they can't find their blanket or their bag that they left. I think most of you know, but um, we left everything in our gloves. But last night, sometimes things happen. You can't even play basketball. And so they shuffled all the tables to the outside of the room. And we put things back as best we can. But just if you're coming in now, and where's my bag, where's my blanket? Yes, it may not be at the table right where you were, but everything should be here. So certainly we're going to take a moment. If you're looking for things for a friends coming in the next few minutes, let them know that. Because it's a little disorienting. I've already walked in. So, so far, we do. You find your blanket to be Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I heard this side of the room. I didn't hear anything over here. How y'all doing? Good, good. My name is Clarissa Clear, and I work the same as Jody. Jody happens to have the Midland cohort, and I have the Big Spring cohort. So I have a Big Spring, Calhoma, and a part of Midland. Um, and so some of my middle teachers were coming and I told Jody I'd help her out and so um, um, she did day one and I'm going to do day two. In fact, this afternoon we're going to kind of do it together. And so don't be surprised if she jumps in because I told her to jump in whenever you want to. I think the advantage is that um, on the 6th and 7th when y'all came back to school, uh, that's when we had our training in Big Spring. Okay? so. Um, between us, we probably have 120 uh, or somewhere close to that, 110 of you all. And so we share, quite often we share ideas and um, we share the kind of content that we're going to be doing. Hopefully I don't trip over the chair. Um, and so sometimes you may have questions that are specific for your cohort and Jody will answer those or people from my cohort and I'll answer those. But um, anyway, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you. Jody said, I'll introduce you. And I said, no, I can do that myself. I'm pretty good. I'm OK. So um, today, what we're doing is really looking at excuse me, analysis of data. We have a couple of videos um, that we'll work through. And then this afternoon, we're going to spend some time working on your artifact. Um, I know that you all kind of started don't tell, okay? <laughs> Y'all kind of started that yesterday, and so we're going to continue that this afternoon and give you some work time, okay? Um, don't feel bad about asking me questions as we go through. I may or may not be able to answer them, but I have a partner, and we may, um, I, it doesn't bother me if you stop me to ask questions. That's okay, all right? Okay, take care of yourself. I know you know where the bathrooms are. You were here yesterday. Anybody that wasn't here yesterday? Oh, good. Okay, so you know where the bathrooms are. We will take a formal break, but if you need to take care of yourself, take care of yourself. I'm feeling those trains. <laughs> and so don't feel like that. You can go ahead and go. It doesn't bother me. So welcome to day two of the, I call them OJM. It's October, January, and March. Welcome to day two of the January OJM training. So in your uh, assessment packet, I mean in your um, handout packet, you have um, these two questions. What did you learn on day one about assessments and data? And how will this knowledge impact uh, what you do, your professional practice? How will this impact what you do? So if you can go over to that page, it will be day two. It's uh, after page 54, I want to say, in your handout packet. That's where day two is. So everybody kind of find that. And when you find it, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good, good. It's over on page three of day two. Page three of day two. And there are two questions there. What types of data 
that we learned about yesterday on day one are referenced explicitly or explicitly named during the video. Oh, that's not it. Page two. What did you learn on day one about assessments and data, and how will this impact your professional practice? So go ahead and answer those, and we'll share out for a minute. It's in your day one. Look on page 54. No, you're fine. Keep turning. Okay, if you are finished at your table, you can kind of talk about uh, what you wrote at your table. What did we learn about yesterday? How will it impact your practice? Go ahead and talk for a minute at your table. Same thing you do, right? Turn and talk. So we can come back together as a learning community. And let's share out a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to think about how to share out such a big group. If you want to say it and I repeat it, you know, raise your hand or something so I can come over to you. I can't pass the mic, but I would if I could. Uh, but if you want to say it, because we want everybody to be able to hear it. So kind of signal me or something. We need some people to share out. Oh yeah, we want to go to lunch on time, so I really need y'all to share out, okay? <laughs> y'all do want to go to lunch today, right? 
<laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so what she said is some of their informative assessments can be, they can be interchangeable depending on how you use them. So with a, a formative assessment, if you don't do anything else afterward, then it becomes a summative assessment. And so that's exactly right. And a summative assessment is supposed to be summative, but if you use it to impact instruction, then it's going to be formative, and that's what she said. Somebody else? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so what she said was she learned that she learned the names of all those assessments and separated them. And it's important for us to know what those assessments are, you know, the names and how they're used, so we can use them in our practice. Did I say that right? Okay, um, so that we can use them in our practice. So yesterday was a good day that even if you know about assessment, um, you may have bits and pieces, but it puts us kind of on the same page, right? And then we can use them in our practice. One more. Come on, one more. What about assessments from yesterday? Y'all spent a whole day talking about assessments. And then I know you spent some time talking about how they impact your practice. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's good, Joan. So what she said was that assessments um, are about our students. We learn a lot about our students, but we also learn about our own teaching and about our practice um, as we look at those assessments. So really important. Thank you, Jody, for saving them. <laughs> okay, so today, looking at our objectives, could I please have um, fifth grade read that one? So we're going to look at some data and analyze it, and hopefully it will inform the instruction if we had those students. But it will help us in terms of looking at our own. Can I have fourth grade, please? Um, that's what we're going to work on. And that's going to be where our artifact is, um, construct an instructional plan. And it's going to be based on the data that we get from assessments. Um, third grade, can you read that one, please? Thank you. Recognizing the characteristics. We have a video this morning. It's a pretty long video, um, but I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And it's on dyslexia. And then second grade. Okay. Okay, one, don't feel bad. You're going to get a chance to read. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about how to differentiate our practice um, after we look at data. So now you have an idea of what we're going to do for the day. I would be remiss without saying where our um, instruction today, where our professional development is going. We all know about um, House Bill 3 and the science of teaching reading. So today we're going to be working in the foundations of the science of teaching reading and we're going to be looking at analysis and response. So you can see where that fits on our, that diamond shape for House Bill 3. This is what our day looks like. And if you were to add those minutes, you would get eight hours of instruction, eight hours of professional development, plus an hour lunch, plus, plus two breaks. We're not going to be here that long, okay? But I wanted you to know um, what TEA says that this training should be. 
Now, I, I don't know if Jody has told you or not, but I must say that this is not training that we designed. Um, it's not training that we thought of or activities that, some of the activities we came up with, but it is straight from TEA and we have to deliver it as they say. Um, this is the training that you're supposed to have today. And like I said, it's eight hours of content, eight hours of content yesterday. You didn't have to stay till 5.30 yesterday. You're not gonna have to stay till 5.30 today. I just want you to know the uh, kind of um, where we are in terms of our professional development. And you can see the kinds of things that we're going to do. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at the House Bill 3 idea of K2 diagnostic assessment. And um, there's a video, and if you want to see that video on your own, I will give you a link or you can Google House Bill 3 and on the House Bill 3 or on the Reading Practices page, there are lots of videos about reading practices and this is one, the K2 Diagnostic Tools. We're not going to see that whole video, we're just going to play a little part of it. The first part of the video talks about text Kia, which is the kindergarten part of the assessment. Um, what we're going to look at is um, first and second grade. And then I'm sure we're going to have some questions after that. I'm positive. So let me adjust a little bit. And this uh, video, again, is the K2 Diagnostic Tools, and it is on TEA's website. First and second grade diagnostic tools are also affected by HB3. Let's take some time to go over those changes. Currently, there is a commissioner's list of acceptable diagnostic tools. HB3 requires that TA provide one no-cost option to diagnose reading development and comprehension. TPRI and Teja Slay will be provided to school districts at no cost. TPRI is a robust diagnostic that includes a screener. New for next year, Teja Slay will also include a screener. Both TPRI and Teja Slay will include an inventory that streamlines the instrument, progress monitoring tools, and a universal screener for dyslexia to admit, be administered during the MLI window. Prior to HB3, TPRI and Tejas Lay were not on the CLI Engage platform. TPRI and Tejas Lay will now be added to the CLI Engage platform and join Circle Progress Monitoring in TechSkia. We will be conducting a competitive process to identify qualified free instruments to diagnose reading for first and second grade. Districts are not required to use one of these instruments. As with the process to name an alternate diagnostic for kindergarten, information will be released through a tooth administrator address letter before the end of December this year. HB3 also requires that the diagnostic tool has a universal screener for dyslexia. The dyslexia handbook lists the components on this slide that must be included on a dyslexia screener. The kindergarten dyslexia screener should be administered during the EOI window. The first grade dyslexia screener must be administered before January 31st during the MOI window. TexKia, TPRI, and Tejas Lay meet the dyslexia screener requirements. Training for use as a dyslexia tool will be covered in the reading academy. HB3 Reading Academies are going to be one of the primary vehicles that training for these diagnostic tools will be provided. There are two primary plans that will meet the statutory requirement, blended or comprehensive. Both models are crafted in the same core content, including both competencies and their demonstration. The comprehensive model is similar to the current Reading Academies, with 10 days of in-person sessions interspersed throughout 15 months and supported by job embedded coaching. The blended model is a facilitated online course with opportunities for additional support and facilitation. While participants in the blended version may work at their own pace, participants will be required to demonstrate each competency to continue to move the course modules. Both models must be offered by authorized providers who are responsible for ensuring that coaches and facilitators are effectively trained and supported. 
Training will also be provided to teachers and administrators during reading, reading academies in the Competency 002 Foundations of Reading Assessment Module. Additional resources, such as detailed decision-making documents, teacher resources, professional development opportunities, and technical assistance will be made available. Before we close today, we want you to know what your next steps are. Don't forget to sign up for the pilot of the TextKia Literacy and Language Screener to ensure your input and feedback is reflected in the process. Click on the link and fill out the Qualtrics survey to get your district name on the list if you're interested. LEAs must choose their first and second grade diagnostic instrument for the 2020-2021 school year. This may be TPRI or Tejas LA, or an alternative research-based and scientifically proven instrument that adheres to the rubric requirements and adopted by their district level committee. The TAA will include attachments of rubrics for each grade level for LEAs to use. Please visit the HB3 page and submit any questions to the HB3 info email. Use the subject line K2 Diagnostic Tools and send to hb 3 info at tea.texas. Please visit the HB3 page and submit any question. I'll stop right here so that if you want to write that web address down and take a picture of it, you can, so you can go in and watch the video, the whole video, or if there are other videos there that you'd like to watch, because it has a whole, um, um, I won't say a plethora, but it has several videos that you might be interested in. Okay, while we're doing that, what questions might you have uh, based on that video? And there's a sheet in your handout that says, um, what? What types of data we learned on day one are referenced explicitly or explicitly named during the video? And what are your big takeaways? Why don't we do that first? Go ahead and answer these questions. You can talk at your table about these questions. You don't have to write them. Um, and then as you talk at your table, you might want to take a few notes or something like that. I know that some of you were jotting down as the video was playing, and that's fine. So go ahead and talk at your table for a minute, and I really am only give you a minute. I just looked at my watch. In five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. I've had some really good questions. One of those is, what's happening for third and fifth grade? We don't know yet. And is the TPRI going to be the paper-based, or is it going to be online, or is it going to be the palm polish like we used to have? Don't know yet. <laughs> that was a good question, wasn't it? <laughs> Don't know yet. But what were some big takeaways that you had from the video? Anything that stood out to you? The TEA is going to pay for all that. The TEA is going to pay for all that, yes. Not only are you going to have access, uh, based on what your district decides, you'll have access to TPRI, but you'll also have access to another research-based assessment. Uh, the commissioner was supposed to decide in December. We're only in January, um, and so it's going to, it's going to come, uh, whatever that research-based uh, assessment is. But I promise you this, the vendors are scrambling trying to make presentations and trying to make their uh, assessment fit the requirements for House Bill 3. Bless you. Anybody? 
We used to use the TPRI a long time ago, yes ma'am. Well, it wasn't that it wasn't good, it was that it took a lot of time. And so from your training yesterday, your professional development yesterday, you saw that it is what kind of assessment? A, the one that starts with the D, yes, diagnostic assessment. And when do you use a diagnostic assessment? Well, I heard three times a year about, do, are you gonna do it with your whole class? Okay, only those kids that really show that they need it after a universal screener, because it's gonna tell you why that student is struggling. Um, and yes, CPRI was a long assessment. As I remember, it took like 30 to 45 minutes to do it until we, huh? Each child, until we got the little Palm Pilot, and then the Palm Pilots became obsolete. And so TPR kind of, I kind of went away because we had these other online assessments that went much more quickly. Um, so, don't know. Yes. As I understand it right now, her question is, we used to do it with every student. Um, and now, are we going to just do it with the students who struggle? Well, ideally, a diagnostic assessment is done with the kids that you recognize that are struggling. Um, we will get specific directions and how to use TPRI when it comes out, but supposedly it's a diagnostic assessment. Yes. Good question. With FMP, with iStation, and now TPRI, possibility TPRI. But who knows? iStation may be that uh, end up being that diagnostic assessment. Uh, FMP may end up being that diagnostic assessment. I have no idea at this point. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, that's a good question. It's TPRI, Tejas Lake. Those two will go together. Yes, sir. So when you adopt TPRI, you are also adopting. For uh, Tejas Lake. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, she said that she didn't think iStation was a good diagnostic tool, but I'm not going to go in there in terms of evaluating them. Um, I'm just, I just want you to know what's out there, what's coming down the pipe. Um, and Really, it's going to be a district decision. Everybody in here is Midland ISD, and so you remember they said it will be based on what your district decides, and so right now we don't know. Any big takeaways that you have? I'm sorry? I didn't hear someone Oh, they have their limitations. So yes, they do have their limitations, and you talked about those yesterday. So you might look at the, some of the limitations, and you might um, share that with your principal, for example, because they may have some input in terms of um, what's gonna happen in your district. TEA has given you the choice right now of the EHASLE, TPRI, the EHASLE, or an uh, alternative assessment, they just haven't selected what that alternative research-based assessment will be, okay? And it's supposed to be in 2021, next school year, that this takes effect. Jody?
So in essence, this is a, a strange year for us in that it's sort of like we're working for TPA, but we're not a TPA employee. We're Texie employees who are a part of this TPA grant. And so as far as, you know, we're representing TPA's reading or reprint pilot this year, but we don't work in the TPA office. And we're not a part of people who make decisions in TPA. But as far as just this reprint pilot, we are one of 60 um, literacy coaches in the state of Texas who are learning this grant. So while we will do everything to communicate what we get from TPA to you guys, some of the specific questions, you know, we're, what we know, we will share. But it's not like we know other information that we're not sure to But I know in the past, that's what's happened, is the commissioner will publish a list and say, your district, because of local control. You know, the school districts do have local control. They have different budgets, different amounts of money. And so they will vet the screeners. And so far, they said, here's one, and that's part of the sharing of this. But we know that there will be some added to it, whether it's one more or four more. That's true. At least one. Yes. At least one way. other research-based um, assessment, and we don't know beyond that. Okay. No clue as to what which one it will be. Like I said, the vendors right now are scrambling, trying to make sure that theirs is the one that's selected. <laughs> Okay, so at your table, choose one of these questions that you might like to answer. Why is it beneficial to have a statewide diagnostic assessment in grade K2? And if this video focuses on assessment, why is so much time given to discussing instructional strategies? Or how can assessment data be used to inform instruction? Pick one of those questions at your table and um, go ahead and discuss that. I'll give you two minutes. Okay. Come back to the learning community in five, 
four, three, two, one. Thank you. So why is it beneficial to have a statewide diagnostic assessment? Anybody? I heard several people over here. I didn't hear this side. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, so they talked a lot about kids moving and knowing where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. And while we're talking about that one, I'm going to ask the table over here, the resource teacher right here, to talk a little bit. So on top of just kids moving, sometimes kids move from one county to the, the another, and they don't qualify for special ed. They did in the place where they used to live, but now in this new county, they don't qualify. So that makes um, having a statewide um, assessment beneficial. What about the second one? If this video focuses on assessment, why is so much time given to instructional strategies? Why do you think? Did anybody discuss that question? <laughs> she said, I'm going to be the pessimist and say because they want us to teach to the test. I don't know that I agree with that. Uh, can somebody else talk about that just a little bit? Why is there time for instructional strategies? Yes, ma'am. So you assess it, you find where their strengths and weaknesses are, and if they um, master those, you can move on to um, the next area. Yes, okay. How can assessment data be used to inform instruction? And that just leads right into that. That comment leads right into that. How could we? Yes, ma'am. y'all hear her? Good. I heard them say yes. What about back there? Yes? Good. Good job, Tony. <laughs> so the next few minutes we're going to talk about dyslexia and dyspraxia. And we have a few videos to watch. One is um, the main dyslexia one, but then there are some sample videos um, that we are going to watch as she walks through. Um, Hi. Oops. And welcome to today's She started before I was ready. Bye. So if you look in your packet, you should have, it, it will be at the end of your packet because, I moved the packet around. I moved, I moved the presentation around. And I put dyslexia at the beginning instead of at the end. So.
delve into the topic of literacy. To really understand dyslexia and dysgraphia, you have to have a deep understanding of the literacy continuum. And in fact, the literacy continuum is recursive, 
and it's built on the foundation of oral language. In fact, the ability to listen and to speak are hardwired neurobiological abilities. Oral language develops naturally through interactions with caretakers, like our parents, our grandparents, our siblings, our early teachers, and no formal instruction is typically required. Reading and writing, on the other hand, are not hardwired neurological abilities. We're not born with the ability to decode alphabet letters into speech sounds and words. But as we learn to read, we recruit existing brain cells and recycle them for the purposes of reading and writing. Literacy itself changes the brain. And learning to read and write requires the establishment of a reading circuit in the brain where the speech, print, and meaning centers of our brain are linked, regardless of language of instruction. And recent technological advances in functional magnetic resonance imaging supports our understanding of the complex connections between these neural networks. Reading is really rocket science. So as you'll note here in this diagram, listening and reading are noted in the green circles, and they're considered receptive language tasks. When you're listening, you're taking in oral information, and when you're reading, you're taking in information through the printed text. So you're inputting information. In contrast, when you're speaking and you are writing, you are expressing yourself. So when you're speaking and you're expressing yourself orally, you're providing information or providing an output, and when you're writing, you're expressing yourself in written text or written medium. Multiple factors support our literacy abilities, including executive functions, oral language, phonological processing, as well as our processing speed and our fine and graphomotor production. I want you to notice the yellow circle that really links listening, speaking, reading, and writing as thinking. And thinking includes the concept of metacognition. And metacognition occurs when students begin to think about their own processes they think of themselves as learners, and they begin to develop the abilities to plan, monitor, and access their own and access their own understanding and performance. Please note this language continuum is recursive, meaning we improve our oral vocabulary and our abilities to use increasingly complex language as we interact with more advanced texts. We know that the demands of reading and writing only increase as students move through grade levels as assignments and tasks grow more and more complex. And academic success is intricately tied to reading and writing achievement. Students face serious consequences if they don't acquire functional literacy skills. And when I say literacy, I mean both reading and writing and oral language. The consequences of reading difficulties include higher dropout rates, involvement with juvenile justice systems, incarceration, low self-esteem, and reduced employment opportunity. The research shows that the reading gap grows without intervention and supports. Gaps may actually be smaller in early elementary school, but continue to widen as students move to middle and high school without critical intervention and supports. Reading and writing occurs across content areas, not only in language arts. Up to 70% of the variance in performance in social studies and science can actually be attributed to reading ability. Let's talk a little bit about Scarborough's Reading Road. It was developed in 2001 by a researcher named Hollis Scarborough. And she really broke down reading into two domains, language comprehension and word recognition. And when the two domains come together, skilled reading is enabled. Well, let's talk about what I'm uh, referring to. When I say skilled reading, I'm really talking about readers who can not only decode, but can comprehend what they are actually decoding. And if you look at word recognition, and language comprehension, they're actually made up of subcomponents. So in the word recognition domain, we're talking about phonological and phonemic awareness, we're talking about decoding, and we're talking about sight word recognition. 
In that language comprehension domain, we're talking about background knowledge, vocabulary, the structures of our language, verbal reasoning, reasoning, and then literacy knowledge. When word recognition and language comprehension come together, skillful reading is enabled. High quality core reading instruction includes systematic and explicit teaching of both domains, word recognition and language comprehension. Educators must be skilled in the science of teaching reading as described here to provide effective literacy instruction. We know that the process of reading becomes increasingly automatic as students develop their decoding skills and also apply their language comprehension abilities to word reading. I want to talk briefly about the five elements of effective reading instruction that were determined by the National Reading Panel back in 2000. In 2000, the NRP concluded its work and submitted its final reports and determined five components of reading. But even awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and of course reading comprehension, which is dependent on adequate skills in each one of these domains. You've already talked about phonemic awareness in your training. I want to briefly hit on it and its importance to word reading. So phonemic awareness is a subset of phonological awareness, and it refers to our ability to attend to the individual speech sounds in the language system. David Kilpatrick notes that every point in a child's development of word level reading is substantially affected by phonological awareness skills, from learning letter names all the way up to efficiently adding new multisyllabic words to our sight vocabulary. David Kilpatrick stresses the importance of phoneme manipulation and its relationship into multisyllabic word reading. I want to give you an example of a substitution activity. So I'll be the teacher, and you'll be the students. Say take. Now change the t to s. What word do you have? Say. That's exactly right. So that was phoneme substitution in the initial position of words. And actually, phoneme substitution in that medial vowel or medial position of the word is a more complex task. We'll go ahead and practice that now. I'll be the teacher again, and you need a student. Say clap. Now, change the at to an it. What word? And you should have said clip. So again, that's substitution in the medial position. Let's talk a little bit about phonics, which is another component that the NRP highlighted. Phonics is a method of teaching reading and spelling that focuses on the relationship between sounds and symbols. English is an alphabetical language. There's roughly 44 phonemes or sounds, but there's over 250 different ways to spell those sounds. That makes English an opaque language, which we're going to talk about later in the presentation. An opaque language is one in which there are multiple ways to spell a sound. I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about the long A sound, as in cake A. And I want you to think about other words that have the long A sound, but are spelled in different ways to represent that sound. What other words can you come up with? What about the number eight? The word hay, as in I need hay for the scarecrow. What about the word they? They go to the park. What about the word rain? When will it rain? All of these words have the long A sound in them, but the long A spec sound is represented by different graphemes in each one of those words. Again, that's an example of why English is an opaque language. And it is also an example, or I should say an indicator, of why it is very important to directly and explicitly teach phonics 
Fluency is another category that was identified by the AOP. And fluency is the ability to read words accurately and with appropriate rate. Fluent readers recognize words and understand them simultaneously. You'll notice here that I've included prosody within oral reading fluency. And prosody is our ability to read with appropriate phrasing and expression. And there's been a lot of research lately that really shows that prosody is actually an indicator of good reading comprehension. Because when students are reading with adequate prosody, they're demonstrating their understanding or comprehension of the text. Vocabulary is another component. And vocabulary acquisition is just the comprehension of words, including the meanings and pronunciation of words in text and in spoken language. We know that when students are being read to at home, when they have parents that are communicating with them and using rich language structures, that that only supports vocabulary acquisition. Tier one words are everyday words and typically do not involve direct instruction in oral language. Tier two words are key content area words and they're very important for academic success and they do require direct instruction. Tier three words are domain specific low frequency words. These words occur in specific content areas and they most definitely require direct instruction because they're not often used in our oral conversation with our friends or our parents or even in other subject areas. So they definitely require direct instruction. And of course, the goal of reading is that students comprehend what they are decoding. Reading comprehension requires adequate fluency and vocabulary skills. And that fluency is very dependent on a student's word level reading ability. In grades four through 12, five areas of effective reading instruction are shown below. Those would be word study, fluency, vocabulary, and of course, student motivation, with the end goal also being that students comprehend what they are reading. Let's delve into dyslexia and related disorders. start out by highlighting the dyslexia handbook. It was actually updated in November of 2018. And there's six major sections of the dyslexia handbook, including five chapters in a series of appendices. The two new chapters are screening and dysgraphia. You'll see those highlighted in red there. All right, and there's some additional appendices that have been added as well. All right, so this slide really provides an overview of the procedures and policies as described in the dyslexia handbook which again was updated in 2018. We're gonna talk about dyslexia screening today. We're gonna to talk about the referral process for evaluation. We'll talk specifically about dyslexia services and of course, the importance of progress monitoring. High quality evidence-based or reading and writing instruction is required for all students. We're gonna take a few minutes now and I want you to read pages one and two in the dyslexia handbook. Those are provided to you in the form of handouts. Once you're done with that, I want you to review common risk factors associated with dyslexia on pages two and three for students in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. And then I want you to highlight or underline key phrases, concepts, and ideas.
It sounds like y'all are about done um, reading those pages and highlighting. So I'm going to start the video again, okay? I'm going to break down dyslexia just a little bit more for you. Dyslexia is a word of Greek origin made up of three morphemes. Dys, lex, and that vowel forming suffix ia. It literally means the condition of having difficulty with words. Dyslexia does have a genetic basis. 50% of persons with dyslexia will typically have an affected family member. That means a sister, a brother, a parent, a grandparent, or a cousin that also has dyslexia. It may look different and present itself differently in the family members, but it is it is very common that someone with dyslexia will have a family member that also has dyslexia. And a high percentage of persons or children who live dyslexia will also have a co-occurring condition. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. These co-occurring conditions can be described here in the HD or a speech and language impairment. Up to 20% of the population will demonstrate some layer or level or characteristics of dyslexia. Not all of those students will be identified or served through special education or section 504, but do know that this is the most common learning disability. Dyslexia is not caused from laziness. It's not caused from low intelligence. It's not caused from a lack of personal motivation or grit or trying. And it's not related to a language acquisition challenge. Students that are English learners may also have dyslexia. In plain language, dyslexia is defined as a brain-based learning disability that makes reading and spelling words accurately and automatically difficult. Dyslexia is not caused by a lack of intelligence or effort, nor is it caused by seeing the letters in words backwards. Primary difficulties that students experience include deficits in phonological awareness, decoding words in isolation, reading unfamiliar or nonsense words, reading fluently, and spelling words accurately. We know that dyslexia can impact access to grade level or higher level text, which can impair vocabulary acquisition, reading comprehension, and written expression. We know that many students with dyslexia suffer from low self-confidence, and that can impact student motivation. We're going to talk a little bit about dyslexia in transparent and opaque orthographies. And orthography is just the writing system of a language. We talked about English earlier as an opaque language. So students with dyslexia oftentimes have early and marked difficulty with word level reading. And 
fluency and comprehension often improve once decoding is mastered. English and French are examples of opaque languages. With transparent languages, students with dyslexia may actually have less difficulty with word level reading, but they may experience more difficulty with fluency and comprehension. So the characteristics of dyslexia may look different dependent on if the language is opaque or transparent. Spanish and German would be examples of transparent languages or languages with a more transparent orthography, which again is the writing system of a language. Take a few minutes and review the characteristics of dyslexia in English and Spanish as shown here on figure 3.6 in the dyslexia handbook. Notice that reading comprehension may be a weakness in both English and Spanish. When students are expending additional cognitive energy decoding and struggling with the decoding aspect, that often interfere, interferes with their ability to comprehend the written text. We talked about Scarborough's reading work earlier and noticed that the word recognition areas are primary weaknesses associated with dyslexia. And these word recognition difficulties impair a student's ability to be a skilled reader and comprehend the text. I want you to take a few minutes here and watch two videos. One is about Maya, about Meryl. Both of these students are experiencing reading challenges and deficits. Thank you for watching this. My name is Maya, I'm in the second grade, and I have trouble reading. When I open up a book, um, some words I can read, some words I can't. I mix up words and sounds sometimes. I would look at pictures and try to read the words that I could read. Other kids were getting done really fast, but I felt like I wasn't learning. And they felt like they were learning, but I didn't feel like I was learning, and I wasn't getting done very fast. I just got really frustrated and I felt like I couldn't do it. I had to read um, books in the summer. Every day I started to read every word that I saw. Now um, I try to um, sound it out. Like if I was doing happy, <laughs> ah, pee, and I um, get the words right. I've been reading road signs and um, every word I see I try to read. I am Meryl, I am in fifth grade, and reading is really hard for me. At first, they'd be like, yeah, we can teach you to read and everything. And they gave me these books, and I didn't understand them. And the homework started piling up horribly. And after one teacher gets so frustrated, I would like cry, and my dad would try to calm me down. And I would throw the book in the trash can, and it was just like so upsetting. I would be on this baby book, and then I would look over and like someone's reading Percy Jackson, and I'm like, how do you do that? And then they would look at me and they're like, they give me like the twirly eye, and they're like, you reading that? I don't want to be friends with you. You can't read. It's like everybody knew how to read, except me. And now everybody knew how to make friends, except me. Well, you're weird. 
둘셋 Well, my teacher um, taught me this thing where it's like you split the thing up and you read one half and then you read the other and it's like, okay, that's the one. And then you read it over and you're like, oh, hmm. And then you remember. I go like adventures a lot and it's really hard to find adventures at my reading level. I remember I heard about the Grimm sisters because my friends were reading them and I'm like, um, can I maybe read it? And they're like, well, it's too hard for you. And um, I was like, now if I get on the ca my Kindle and I can, I can listen to it, but I can still read it. And I, I start reading it and I read all those series. I've already read all the series. I'm reading the Odyssey in my writing class and I never dreamed I could read a book like that. I would just I'd start picturing it in my head and I'm like, you're wanting to get sucked in. And then your teacher like, class time is over. It's been 45 minutes and you're like, it's been two minutes, and I'm still in this book. Parent and teacher resource for learning more about students with learning and attentional difficulties. I want you to share your work reflections of the videos with your partner or your table mates. If you'll go ahead and share, I'll give you a couple minutes. or your table name. In your packet, 
uh, close to the last page maybe, uh, there's a prayer model. Uh, for There's one on dyslexia. The top part is dyslexia and the bottom part is dysgraphia. Just do the top part. Oh, there it is. The last page. It's on page 31. Page 31 of your packet is the last page. So first you have to define it, and then you're going to share um, with your partner or at your table. I'm glad some of you are using your book to help you out. That's good.
once you are, once you have yours completed, share at your table. And we'll start again. Uh, it sounds like most of you have had the opportunity to share, and um, I'm glad to see that most of you used your book to come up with, um, to fill in your prayer monitor. And as I walked around, pretty much because you used the, the book, they look kind of the same. So we're going to keep going. Is that okay? page 59 in the Dyslexia Handbook on dysgraphia, which is a related disorder to dyslexia. I'd like you to highlight or underline key phrases, concepts, and ideas.
Put your finger up if you need more time. Okay. If you're finished with 59, you can go ahead and read the top of page 60. Put your finger up if you need more time. Let's demystify and break down <coughs> what dysgraphia is. Again, it's a Greek word made up of three morphemes. Dis, graph, and the vowel forming suffix ia. Literally, it means a difficulty with writing. In plain language, dysgraphia is defined as a brain-based learning disability that is characterized by difficulties with handwriting and spelling. And although students will have primary difficulties in basic transcription skills, written expression is typically compromised. Notice dysgraphia is a related disorder to dyslexia. Researchers estimate that about 5 to 15 percent of the population has some layer or level of dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is also comorbid with dyslexia. All right, let's take a few minutes here and consider characteristics of dysgraphia. Students with dysgraphia will typically produce poorly formed letters. They may excessively erase or cross out letters or words. They may demonstrate poor spacing between letters and within and between words. They may produce letter and number reversals beyond the end of first grade when we're expecting reversals to become extinguished. They may demonstrate an awkward, an inconsistent, or a dysfunctional pencil grip. They may produce inadequate heavy or variable pencil pressure during handwriting tasks. You may see these students writing so lightly that you cannot actually read what they produced, or you may see that they're writing with such force that they're actually tearing the paper. They may demonstrate hand fatigue, like 
pulling on their fingers or popping their knuckles or shaking their hands out or even expressing the fact that their hands are feeling very tired. They may produce slow writing and copying speed with legible or even illegible handwriting. They may copy words and or sentences inefficiently, incorrectly, or ineffectively, even when a model is provided, and they may simply avoid written texts. When we're thinking about dyspraxia, we're really thinking about those lower level transcription skills, so difficulties or deficits with handwriting and spelling. And students with dyspraxia may even pick up keyboarding at a slower pace or rate. So we have to consider the fact that these students are going to need explicit instruction in these areas, as well as keyboarding. So primary deficits in basic transcription negatively affect written expression. Let's look at a writing sample here. I'm going to go ahead and decode or read this writing sample because the handwriting makes it difficult for you to do so. And as I read this, I want you to consider what characteristics of dyslexia that you are observing or noticing. Hi, Robin asked me for a sample of my handwriting because I have dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is a term for learning disabilities that affect spelling and handwriting. I should probably point out that despite how my handwriting looks, I'm 26 and have a business degree from UPEI with a minor in economics. Dysgraphia is a lifelong condition. It does not mean that children should not receive evidence-based intervention to support their writing abilities, but typically students with dysgraphia and dyslexia will demonstrate continued challenges throughout their life with language activities such as reading and some of the characteristics of dysgraphia that I noticed in the sample. On that first line, I noticed a reversal of the letter B. It was reversed to, to, uh, to make a D. I also noticed letters that were floating above the line, some letters floating below the line, with that letter S should not be floating below the line. I also noticed some uppercase letters in words that shouldn't be there and some unusually formed letters, letters that were begun in the wrong spot on the line. I noticed letters that were uh, unusually close together or maybe even too far apart. On that second line, that word sample is obviously misspelled, but I also noticed an unusual spacing between the syllables. I wonder if, if this adult is actually having to break down the word into syllables, and then you see that represented there on that second line in that word sample. Notice that the student misspelled handwriting. Obviously, handwriting is a compound word, but he represented that I sound with the wrong graphene. I-G-H is not how we represent the long I sound in that word. Notice on the fourth line, the student spelled dysgraphia, but then on the, excuse me, on the third line spelled dysgraphia one way, and then on the fourth line misspelled dysgraphia in another way. He was representing that sound with the pH correctly on the third line, but on the fourth line was representing it incorrectly with an FF. Also notice additional cross outs in this sample, as well as some illegibility. And just overall, this writing is not in harmony with this individual's cognitive abilities. We see that this individual has a business degree and a minor in economics, we would expect someone that had achieved that level of success to have handwriting that matched that. I'd like you to take a few moments now and watch these two understood videos on Aiden and Lucy. They're going to describe their difficulties with writing. My name is Aiden. 
I'm in first grade and writing is really hard for me. Writing with a pencil, like, it makes me really worried that I'm going to make a mistake. Sometimes I just, like, get frustrated. It makes me feel like um, I'm going to make a mistake, so sometimes I just don't want to do it. Well, the hardest is, like, drawing stuff right. Like, drawing a picture is, like, hard, so I just do scribble scrabble sometimes. I just remember that I always got in trouble. We got some shaving cream out of a cupboard, then we just sprayed it on the table, and then, like, it was... We made old types of colors, then we did that. Then I got my fingernail, then I traced the alphabet. A, I, D, A, N. Sometimes I still make mistakes, but I just erase it sometimes, or if it's pen, then I just scratch it out, then write on top. And sometimes I just try my best. My name is Lucy. I'm in the fifth grade, and writing is a huge struggle. I would. Suffering, not all what I expected. I have the whole thing written down in my head. Martin Luther King was a great man who helped lots of people in many ways. But the act of writing that thing, that paragraph, excruciatingly hard. So, like, eager to get my ideas out there. I used to skip words. It wouldn't make sense to me. Martin Luther King, great man. When I was done, it'd be, I couldn't even read it myself. Is that a J or an F? I'd hope and hope the teachers wouldn't read mine because I knew that everyone else had written a paragraph of nine and three sentences. I was trying my very hardest and I just couldn't do it. What I find helps, especially for me, cursive, because with print I used to forget what I was writing halfway through a word. Since in cursive it's all one fluid motion, you can just write. And since it's faster, I can get my ideas out there faster. With writing, one thing that helped me was to be able to organize my ideas with something called a graphic organizer. It's just a page of paper that has a spot for a topic, a spot for certain ideas, key ideas, some details about those key ideas, and a conclusion. We are writing reviews about a granola bar we had made ourselves. I was writing, and I finished, and I showed it to my teacher, and he looked at it for a few minutes, and then came over to our table and said, Lucy, this looks like I'm reading something a food critic wrote. And I was like, thank you. For you to do so. And as I read this, the challenges throughout as you build your definition within the same section of the prayer model. And then I'd like you to take a few moments and share your definition and the characteristics with your partner or your table mates. So um, now you want to do your definition on your prayer model? 
you did dyslexia, so now do dysgraphia. Looks like most of you have completed your writing, so go ahead and talk at your table for a moment about your definition for this graph here. You may even have a couple of specific examples that you'd like to share with your table.
<laughs> as soon as this video is over, we'll take a break. Let's just push through. Is that okay? mentioned common associated difficulties and students with dyslexia and dysgraphia may also uh, have challenges with math. They may be identified with dyscalculia, which just going back to our Greek lesson, uh, that is a difficulty literally in Greek translated to a difficulty with counting, but students with dyscalculia would have difficulties uh, performing basic math facts and learning their math facts. Uh, they may have difficulties with rounding and estimating uh, with fractions and percentages as well. Students with dyslexia and dysgraphia may also have executive function challenges, uh, one being attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD. And then we also have language challenges in areas of articulation or specific word retrieval or naming deficits. These are not uncommon challenges for students with dyslexia and dysgraphia to have. So let's take a few minutes and test your knowledge. Dyslexia is a brain-based learning disability that makes blank and blank and writing difficult. What is it, y'all? Dysgraphia okay. primarily affects blank and may interfere with blank and written composition. What is it? Affects writing and may interfere with? So dyslexia is a brain-based learning disability that makes reading, spelling, and writing difficult. And dysgraphia primarily affects handwriting and may interfere with spelling and written composition. The spelling is a similarity between dyslexia and dysgraphia. In both dyslexia and dysgraphia, you are likely to see significant spelling deficits or challenges. Let's talk about uh, the dyslexia screener and reading <coughs> diagnostic tools that are used in Texas. I'm going to stop right here and yay! I'm so excited. So if we can come back to the learning community, we're going to start the video again. And that's probably going to, um, I think it's going to take us to, uh, or I think she's got about 20 more minutes, at least 20 to 30 more minutes um, on dyslexia. So now we're really talking about screening. And this is where we're ready to start. Any questions before we get started? No questions? One or two comments? Anybody have a comment? Okay, we're ready to start. So first of all, just to talk a little bit about screening. Screening should be cost-effective, brief, should be valid and reliable, and it should be provided by trained personnel. It is defined as a universal measure administered to all students by qualified personnel to determine which students are at risk for learning difficulties. Please notice classroom teachers are typically the ones that are providing dyslexia screening in the state of Texas. So you would be that qualified personnel to do that. Doesn't mean you should not be receiving training. You should be receiving training on what the screening uh, practices are in your district. Screening identifies predictive variables. Think of red flags. Also, students should not be re-screened for conditions that they've already been identified with. If you have a student that's already been identified with dyslexia, they should not be re-screened. Screening is not a formal evaluation. And screening does not require parent consent. So Texas Education Code 38.003 was established in 2017, and in kindergarten, students are to be screened for dyslexia by the end of the school year. And in first grade, students are to be screened no later than January 31st. 
and students are to be screened as appropriate beyond first grade, and that would be determined by the campus. We also have Texas Education Code 28.006, which requires students in kindergarten, first, and second grade to receive a reading diagnostic tool. Students that do not pass the sixth grade reading star test are to be given a reading diagnostic tool in seventh grade that looks at phonics, text comprehension, and fluency. Please note the specific components that should be assessed in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. Pause the video now and turn and talk to your table mates about what diagnostic tools and instruments or districts are utilizing. And actually, I think we've talked about Thank that. We're sharing that information. We're so we're going to keep going. Talk about evaluation of dyslexia and dysgraphia. When considering evaluation for students with dyslexia and dysgraphia, there should be a campus level team of knowledgeable persons making referral decisions. You actually may be on one of those RTI or MTSS or child study teams. You may be a part of that decision making team. Teams should refer for evaluation at any time disability is suspected. So if a child is suspected of having a learning disability and requiring special education, the child should be referred for a special education evaluation. Tiered services, meaning RTI or MTSS, may not and should not be used to delay or deny a special education evaluation if disability and a need for services are suspected. Districts should comply with all federal and state laws, including the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that's our IDEA or IDEA, also known as our Special Education Law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, known as Section 504, and of course the laws provided in our Texas Education Code and our Texas Administrative Code. Parents, the school, and the community may also request a special education evaluation. So again, when disability and a need for special education is suspected, districts should refer students for evaluation under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that IDEA, to determine eligibility for special education, as well as develop recommendations for supports and services. Federal guidance includes the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was mentioned earlier. And IDEA defines a specific learning disability as a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using language, spoken or written, that may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations. Notice dyslexia and dysgraphia would be included in a specific learning disability. Not all students with dyslexia or dysgraphia would qualify for specially designed instruction under the IDEA. Some students with dyslexia and dysgraphia may receive protections under Section 504. A student does not need to demonstrate educational need to meet eligibility for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Components of a comprehensive evaluation include knowledge of the student being assessed, validated evaluation instruments, trained personnel, following all special education and Section 504 evaluation procedures, the incorporation of both formal and informal data, a deep knowledge of dyslexia and related disorders, and should the student be an English learner, an LPAT member must be a part of the evaluation. Let's move into supports for students with dyslexia. When we're talking about supports for students with dyslexia, we're going to start with high quality, poor reading and writing instruction. Students with dyslexia and dysgraphia also need evidence-based intervention to make academic progress. They may also benefit from accommodations and or modifications as determined by that special education or section 504 committee and they may also benefit from assistive technology. We're going to talk about each one of these components. First of all, the importance of high quality, 
for instruction. All students should receive high quality or language arts instruction. Educators should receive specific training on the curricula and materials they are using to ensure fidelity of implementation. I'd like you to pause here and talk about what core instruction is being provided in your classroom and on your campus. If you could talk for a moment about the core instruction. Share with your teams and mates. Let's talk about team. Talk for a moment about core instruction. What is it in your classroom? You can shout it out. What is the core instruction in your classroom for reading and writing? Anybody? What is the core instruction in Midland ISD for reading and writing in grades K to five? K to five. I'm sorry to hear you. F and P in the classroom. What kind of screening do we do? We do benchmark assessments. What else? I'm sorry, I station. Yes. And is there one more? F and P assessments. Okay. So we're providing instruction and/or intervention for students with dyslexia and/or dyspraxia. First of all, highly trained personnel should be the providers of the dyslexia intervention. Although these persons are not required to hold a specific license or certification, they must have additional documented dyslexia training, and they must be trained in the program that they are implementing according to the program guidelines of that specific curriculum. Licensure is available through professional organizations, including the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. Educators who teach students with dyslexia should be trained in new research and practices related to dyslexia. That would be you. Most all of us are serving students with dyslexia and or dysgraphia in our classrooms. That means that we should receive training in new research and best practices. You're doing that now by listening and participating in this webinar. No, university candidates must receive instruction in dyslexia as well. Let's pause here and talk briefly about why might it be important for all educators to receive some training on dyslexia. Okay, so what? Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. So why do you think it's important that we are having this dyslexia video? Why do you think it's important that we have some training in um, dyslexia dysgraphia? What do you think? Okay, I heard early identification. Anybody else? Okay, sometimes there's something wrong, but we don't know what it is. And so this is going to help us. It's one of the tools that will help us to maybe identify some learning difficulties that our students may be having. Anybody else? So you stay abreast on uh, current practices. Okay, to know about current practices. And how about that first one right there? To be able to deliver high quality core instruction and to provide support. If we don't know what the problem is, we can't provide, we can't scaffold our students or provide the support that they need. Please. Yeah. 
I, I agree with Jody. We've had some conversations as well. I've had some conversations as well this morning. And uh, we were looking at some of the writing samples and um, one of the teachers said, all my kids look like this about fourth and fifth grade. But sometimes um, they just may not have had the instruction needed. Then on the other hand, kindergarten, they all look dyslexic. They all act dyslexic. <laughs> but um, by the time they're in first grade, you should be able to sort through some of those problems. And if they've had really good instruction in first grade from you, and there's still some issues that crop up, talk with a colleague and do some assessing, like Jody said, on your own to determine. Because everybody in first grade that's struggling is not dyslexic or dysgraphic. You have to kind of do some research and figure out what that problem is. And then by the time they're in fourth and fifth grade, if they're writing like some of the people we saw, make sure it's not an instructional issue, a core instructional issue, rather than dyslexia or dysgraphia. And I've heard some of you kind of talking about that as we go along. Um, so I, I think for our students that have dyslexia or that are dyslexic or that have dysgraphia, we want to provide support for them. But we also want to be sure that that's the support that they need. The same with um, our special ed students. We do a lot of evaluation in our classroom with them on the work they do before we actually get to a referral. Would y'all agree? Y'all just say anything. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Why do we do? Um, why do we do a dyslexia screener in kinder and first if they're not going to be identified as dyslexic? We don't know that they're not going to be identified. So um, we, it's a screener. It's a screener, and we have to do a screener to see if they're at risk for uh, not reading and writing. So from the screener, if they show severe difficulty and you're wondering, uh, you know, uh, what do I do or why are they having this problem, that's when we go to the diagnostic assessment because the diagnostic assessment is going to tell us why they're struggling. Now, if they come in kinder or they come in first and they haven't had schooling, that tells you right there that they haven't had educational opportunity. And so it's not a dyslexic or a dysgraphic problem is that they haven't had the opportunity to have good core instruction, right? And so you have to look at your kids on an individual basis to determine 
you know, what is the issue here? Have they not been in school? Or if they have been in school, you know, um, let's do the screener, let's do the diagnostic assessment like that. Yes, ma'am. In second grade? Okay. And actually, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a, a good thing. Um, but then you have to look at my background to see why I would say that. Because like I said, all the kindergartners look dyslexic. Um, and a lot of the first graders may look dyslexic until they've had some really good instruction from you. And so if Midland says they're not going to be uh, determined until second grade, then in first grade, you're going to have to do some diagnosis and determine where is the issue and um, uh, try to support that so that your kids can be referred or whatever. Because even with special ed, your kids are not referred in first grade because they can't show, it's very difficult to show that they're two years behind in first grade. Um, and so it's only an extreme thing or maybe they come in from EC, ECRI um, and that's when they might be determined early to be in special ed. But if they're not, if they haven't been in that early childhood program, the ECRI, and they're in first grade, it's difficult to show that they're behind two years in order to qualify for special ed. So that makes sense that they would not be able to get into special ed, uh, in special ed or qualify for special ed until second grade, because then you could show that they're below kinder level. In special ed, when they're um, when kids are qualifying for special ed, there has to be this deficit. And if you talk with the diagnostician, the diagnostician will tell you they're looking for uh, a two-year deficit. So if you think about, let's take it out of that context and let's look at um, when you have this baby and you take them to the doctor and you know they have those growth charts, weight and length. Um, there's a normal range in terms of length and in terms of weight. And if they fall below that, then they're considered, you know, you know, maybe that they're not gaining weight enough and the doctor may prescribe some extra formula or give them some cereal or something like that. But if they're on the other end of that chart, um, and the high end of that chart, they're way past normal, they're considered obese. Uh, if that's not, if some skinny person 
uh, came up with that word, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> no offense you skinny people, but, uh, <laughs> no, some skinny doctor came up with that word. Um, so if, there, if this is the normal range in terms of weight and that baby's way over here, then the doctor's gonna wanna cut back on um, um, their intake of food in order to help them decrease and come back to that normal, to that normal weight. So when we look at kids in that way, um, if they're, when we're looking at special ed, let's say, in second grade, um, and they're below what is considered norm, normal on a norm reference test, if there's a standard deviation outside of that or on that low end, that's what happens in terms of language or um, listening, speaking, reading, writing, spelling, all of that stuff. They're on that end. Um, even in math, that's how they qualify for special ed because they are so far away from what is considered um, the, that midpoint if you looked at a bell curve. Okay, so when you go to an ARD and they give you those scores, they may even give you a chart and say, this is the, the, what's considered the norm or the range, and this student scored way down here. That's why they give you those numbers. So you can understand why or how they qualify for special ed, or those DNQs who are at the lower rank, DNQ meaning did not qualify, um, they're working as fast and hard as they can, but they're at the low end of that normal range and they don't qualify for special ed. Okay? The DAQ? The DAQs. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jody. Jody, that's a great explanation. That's a great.
Well, they, they're low average, but they're still, you still have that average in there, so they're expected to meet those requirements. But if you remember, part of the idea behind a high stakes assessment is so that we are discussing or able to discuss apples with apples, and it gives us a way to talk about um, achievement or whatever, um, and, and uh, be able to compare across the board. Okay, so we're going to continue with our dyslexia. Um, Let's delve into specific intervention instruments that are described in the dyslexia handbook in chapter four. I also want you to see the relationship between these components in the intervention and the National Reading Panel's findings of the big five, which are, of course, the level of awareness, phonics, vocabulary, reading fluency, and reading comprehension. These intervention components, like I said, are described in the dyslexia handbook in chapter four, and really just give a little more detail about each one of the components mentioned by the big five. The first one is phonemic awareness, really focusing on blending, segmenting, and then manipulating sounds within words. The second component is letter identification and naming, specifically the alphabet. Think about sequence and naming fluency. We know students with dyslexia are likely to have letter naming fluency deficits, so we really want to hone in on that. Students with dyslexia and dysgraphia often have significant sequencing deficits, meaning they have a difficulty naming that alphabet in order automatically and without a lot of support. Students with dyslexia need direct and explicit instruction in phonics, in mapping those sounds to letter and letter clusters, and then blending or decoding, and then spelling and encoding those words with automaticity. They need direct instruction in spelling, and really spelling goes right along with phonics. As you're teaching those phonics skills, you're also helping the students to map those sounds and those words to print through the written system of the language, which is orthography. Students definitely need practice with reading fluency, and of course, instruction in reading comprehension as well. Additional components include direct instruction in syllabication of multisyllabic words. In morphology, I want you to think about Latin and Greek root words. Think about syntax, the grammar, the capitalization, punctuation, and indentation components of our orthography or our written system, as well as supports developing and composing a well written sentence. So really going to that word and sentence level is very important for these students. They need direct instruction in the writing component as well. Vocabulary is another huge area of focus because think about when students have dyslexia and dysgraphia, they're oftentimes not interacting with grade level text 
and being exposed to those higher level tier two and tier three words. So there's some specific ways that you can support students' acquisition of vocabulary by focusing in on those academic, academic tier two words, as well as some word mapping, and really building a nice and juicy word bank for the students. Handwriting is another huge component that really should be um, supported through the alphabet and through phonics and spelling instruction as well. And of course, lastly, students should be progress monitored. So progress monitor data allows teachers and instructional committees to make effective decisions for students. Progress monitoring allows teams to make informed decisions about student progress based on data. It allows teams to estimate rates of improvement over time. It also allows teams to identify students who do not make adequate progress and then determine when an instructional change is needed, when intervention should be intensified. The Dyslexia Handbook also spells out not only the components of the instruction, but how the instruction should be delivered. This is also in Chapter 4 of the Handbook. But instruction should be delivered simultaneously and in a multi-sensory format, systematically thinking about the more simple complex to the more complex uh, concepts, cumulatively, so there's always spiral review and checking for understanding explicitly, we're talking about direct instruction, directly teaching what you want the student to be able to know and do. We need to think about synthetic and analytic instruction as part of that intervention. I'd like you to spend about 10 minutes reading the T2% targeting the 2% article with instructional considerations to deepen your understanding of instructional components for students with dyslexia. Again, Highlight or underline key phrases and concepts and ideas as you move through this very important and powerful article. Okay. That article is in your handout. And I'll tell you what page in a second. Yes, thank you. Page 22, and it's about six, eight pages, about eight pages if you'll read through that, and I'll give you 10 minutes, and then I'll tell you what, I'll give you eight minutes, and then I'll see where you are if you need more time, okay? Get your highlighter, you can highlight as you go if you like.
With your finger, show me how it's going to be. Okay. Okay, if we can come back to the learning community in three, two, one. Thank you for coming back to the learning community. Let's talk together for a moment. Okay, I'll wait. When we're ready. Thank you for coming back to the learning community. Um, since this is Midland ISD, what type of intervention programs are offered in the district? LLI, Level Literacy Intervention, Take Flight. Um, is that that's the dyslexia program? Okay, that's what I was wondering. Um, what about on your campus? Do you have something that's in addition to LLI or Take Flight? No? Okay, that's where we are. Okay. Um, when students are identified with dyslexia, do they automatically go into Take Flight? And who teaches that? Do you have a dyslexia specialist on your campus? Or does, uh, I see, yes. Oh, sometimes they're shared, what did you say? They go to several campuses and they work with the dyslexia, dyslexia students. Do you know what their load is? How many kids or how many campuses they might have? 
Shout it out for me. Oh, it varies by campus. Okay. So they may only be on your campus uh, one or two days a week or something like that? Half day on one campus, half day on another? Okay. So they float around. Um, I wanted to bring that out because um, you may not be familiar with what happens on your campus in terms of dyslexia, when a student is referred, what happens after that. And so um, I wanted to bring that out a little bit. Okay. What type of intervention programs are offered in your district and on your campus to support students identifying with dyslexia? I'd like you to turn and talk with your table mates about this prompt. We just did that. A modification, on the other hand, changes what they are learning. So it changes the level of this. It is to support students with dyslexia. What type of intervention programs are offered in for students identified with dyslexia? I'd like you. Accommodations and modifications can be used to support students with dyslexia and dyspraxia. These accommodations and modifications should be determined by the Section 504 or Special Education Committee. Please note an accommodation changes how a student is learning and what they are producing. A modification, on the other hand, changes what they are learning. So it changes the level of the standard, right? So let's talk about this a little bit deeper. So when we're talking about an accommodation, we're often giving a child a choice in how they are learning or in how they are demonstrating their knowledge. For instance, a student who is not reading on grade level could be accommodated through the use of an Audible book program or some type of Audible application on their phone so that they can be listening to grade level or above grade level text and interacting with that book and we're removing the barrier of decoding or word level reading. Um, that is a very powerful strategy for accommodating students because that allows students to be accessing higher level thinking and accessing all of those tier two and tier three vocabulary words that they're likely not being exposed to in oral language. So that is a very powerful strategy. Another accommodation will be to allow a student with dyslexia and or dysgraphia to orally explain their thinking versus writing it down, or maybe they're going to use some type of speech to text application, or possibly uh, they're going to you know, produce a different method or way of demonstrating their learning and thinking. A modification again changes what the student is learning. So I may have to modify when I'm providing reading instruction to a student. I may not be providing reading instruction at grade level because their decoding skills are not at grade level. So then I'm going back and I'm addressing earlier foundational skills that the student did not acquire. That would be modifying. Again, those accommodations and modifications should be determined through a Section 504 or Special Education Committee. And the purpose of both accommodations and modifications is to ensure FAPE or free, appropriate public education. Some examples of accommodations, and these are also found in that dyslexia handbook, but some examples would be copies of notes. So if you have a student that has dyscraphia and it takes them a very long time to transcribe information during oral presentations or from the board or from a textbook, it may be very helpful for the student to give them a copy of your notes or to provide a skeleton outline that guides them when they're taking notes. Earlier in the presentation, I checked your knowledge of dyslexia and dysgraphia, uh, and I basically allowed you to kind of fill in the blank. That would be another example of a note-taking guide that you might provide a student. So really, you're removing the barrier of transcription, but you're getting right to the heart of, do they understand or comprehend, or can they give me the main idea of the lesson? Note-taking assistance is another helpful accommodation. Uh, reduced or shortened assignments would be an accommodation. However, if I am changing what I want the student to demonstrate in any way, so 
so that now I'm using the low grade level student expectations, that would be a modification. Planners may be incredibly helpful for students with dyslexia and dysgraphia, but also demonstrate, demonstrate sequencing or executive function deficits. Again, students may need direct instruction in how to use that planner to assist them. Here's some examples of assistive technology. Note that these audible book programs, talking book program, learning ally, and bookshare are free programs for students identified with dyslexia. And these programs provide books for students to access that are completely audible. Um, so I highly encourage you to talk with the district personnel and getting these programs on your campuses and in your districts if they're not already being used and implemented. I'd like to take a few minutes here for you to talk at your tables about your personal experience using audible books in your classrooms with students that have reading difficulties or reading disabilities. Okay, at this point I think we're going to keep going. Is that okay? Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with Audible book programs. In a moment, I'm going to give you some links so you can learn more about those programs. I want to briefly talk about the House Bill 3 dyslexia allotment, which was just passed with the implementation of House Bill 3. So with the House Bill 3 dyslexia allotment, students that have been identified with dyslexia or a related disorder that does include dysgraphia, and students are receiving dyslexia services as indicated in TSDS themes, right? So they could have a section 504 or some type of special education plan for their dyslexia. They could be receiving accommodations on state tests or modifications in the classroom, or they could be receiving dyslexia intervention. Those are what we're considering dyslexia services. When those are noted in themes, districts are eligible to receive a dyslexia allotment per pupil identified and receiving services. And right now that amount is about $616 per student. Let's go ahead and wrap up and talk a little bit more about the resources that I mentioned earlier. We know that students with dyslexia and related disorders can be supported through a multifaceted team approach. It is not only the dyslexia interventionist and the special education teacher that is supporting the student with dyslexia. It is also the classroom teacher. Components of a wraparound team approach include progress monitoring, evaluation when and if appropriate, strong core literacy instruction based in evidence, evidence-based intervention, accommodations and modifications if appropriate and determined by that 504 or special ed committee, trained personnel who are providing the interventions and also completing the evaluations. You always want to identify student strengths. So what is the student really good at? What is he or her really interested in? What are some personal strengths of these? Focusing on the strengths and then providing those supports. And also consider assistive technology. There are those audible book programs that are free for students with dyslexia that can and should be implemented so that we can allow students who are reading below grade level access to grade level or above grade level text. Here you'll notice some dyslexia resources. There are additional resources on the special education webpage noted there. Those include dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia in the IEP document. We also have dyslexia resources in our TEKS guides. We have a dyslexia hotline noted there. If you're interested in learning more about Bookshare or Learning Ally, please visit the Accessible Instructional Materials link. I'd like you to take a few minutes and reflect what you learned or gained from today's session that can improve your ability to better serve your students. Go ahead and write those notes down on your reflection sheet. Your reflection sheet is at the beginning of your packet where you wrote um, on that first page, I think. The first page of the dyslexia part. 
the bottom of that page, 21. Okay, so most of you are finished your reflections. Go ahead and talk at your table for a moment and um, see what each other learned and come up with one that maybe in common was something that you learned at your table. Or one was a surprise. Talk for a couple of minutes or a minute. Okay, we have 11 tables, and every table is going to share at least one thing before we go to lunch. Okay? So if you want to go to lunch, you got to share. All right? One sentence. <laughs> okay, at least one sentence. That's all I'm asking for. Okay, this table right here. You want to use, you learned about using audiobooks with your dyslexic students. Okay, next table. 20% of the population is um, affected with dyslexia. So that means everybody in your class is not going to be dyslexic if they're struggling, right? Another table. Got two down? Yes. Okay. Teaching systematically so they can be identified if they fall behind. What grade do you teach? Kindergarten. Good point. Okay. Okay, that RTI doesn't have to be done to get a student tested. What do we have to do? Can you say no? Have to screen them, yes. Yes, we have to screen them. And the more data you have, the better.
Okay, and being intentional with your um, intervention, and then the difference between dyslexia and dysgraphia. Good. One, two, three, four. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and then there's also this cal calculia. I can't say that very well, but it's the math one. <laughs> okay, this table, this table, yes. <laughs> okay, so upper grade, you may need to go back and look at phonemic awareness because that may be something that passed by your kids at some point, but when you do your screener or you do your diagnostic assessment, that's when that phonemic awareness may come out. But you may need to do it with a small group of kids or individually. Okay. Come on, we got three more tables, I think. This table, that table, and that table. Didn't know about this graph here. Okay, okay, so that's something that really was new for a lot of us in terms of uh, neural processing, this graph here. Okay, this table, that table. Okay, so just the quantity of graphemes, okay, or, or phonemes, sorry, not graphemes, phonemes. All right, good point. Do we hear from this table? I did. Okay, guess what? It's time to go to lunch.